Uh, we're a Silicon Valley team. Like me and my co-founder, we both grew up in the Bay Area. And one of the core ethos of Silicon Valley is to build things that customers want, to solve problems that customers have. Something that we try to stay away from is over-engineering for the sake of building cool technology, which I think is like really common in crypto, interestingly. Um, there's a lot of projects out there that are building cool tech for the sake of building cool tech. The, the problem that you really want to solve is what are the existing problems with the user experience right now and how do you improve those? All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Jay here. Uh, Jay, I thought a great place to start this conversation is around the evolution of L1. So if we go all the way back to you know 2008, 2009, Bitcoin really was the first layer one. And it came out and it was the idea and promise of becoming electronic money. I think for the most part, people are very excited about Bitcoin. It's still kind of the king when you look at market cap dominance, et cetera. But Vitalik Buterin and others said, hey, Bitcoin can't do everything. And what if we take the idea of this blockchain layer one and we add in smart contracts and we got the rise of Ethereum and kind of everything that happened on that platform. Since that day, there has been an explosion of interest and development of L1s. Say, which you are co-founder of, is one of those uh, kind of L1s that's really going after this. And so can you help us understand, like, how do you look at the L1 landscape and its evolution from the launch of Bitcoin and Ethereum to maybe what it looks mm -hmm. like today? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think so far there have just been three major chains that really matter. Um, the first one is obviously Bitcoin, as you mentioned. And I think it was really interesting because that helped kind of unlock this idea of a blockchain. Um, before then, this kind of like uh, distributed ledger to solve this kind of problem, no one had really thought about solving it in the same way. Um, so I think that was the first kind of major unlock. Um, the second thing that happened was Ethereum introduced this idea of a... Um, basically a Turing complete state machine. Like people are able to write smart contracts that in theory are able to do anything. The only limitations around that are this component, this concept of gas, um, which kind of make it a quasi Turing complete uh, virtual machine. And I think that was like a major unlock because it allowed you to build anything that you wanted to on top of the state machine itself. Um, I think since then, there's only been one other major unlock, uh, which is in my opinion, Solana. Um, and what Solana really did is it helped make crypto accessible for everyone um, through building really high performance infrastructure. And the reason that high performance infrastructure is important is because when you make a lot of the optimization that Solana did, um, for example, by supporting parallelization, it helps do two things. Um, the first is it makes gas fees much cheaper. So it makes it much easier for people um, to access the state machine during periods of higher congestion. Like on Ethereum, if you're spending like $100 for transaction fees, you end up excluding most of the global population from using it. Um, in Solana's case, it's much cheaper than that. So I think that is one side of it. And the other side of it is just the type of activity, uh, specifically the type of decentralized application that you're able to support. Um, it's very restricted on Ethereum L1. And I think building this high performance infrastructure um, really allows you to explore different design spaces developer. So it allows for fundamentally new types of applications to get built. So that's where we've been so far. Um, the question then is like, what direction is the industry moving in uh, going forward? So I think there's been a lot of different types of um, things that people have experimented with. Um, I mean, we've seen different experiments with people trying to build these share security type of L1s. Uh, for example, like Polkadot, uh, Cognos, HubSell, um, their ones. Um, I think there's also been people experimenting with different consensus mechanisms while still offering similar types of virtual machines. Um, and there's also been folks that have been trying to just build new virtual machines entirely. Uh, for example, the movie ecosystems. Um, in terms of what I'm seeing right now, I think there's essentially a couple of core things. Um, the first is that the EVM is here to stay. Uh, the EVM is what kickstarted a lot of the activity that we're seeing on chain right now. And it's really difficult to, uh, to replace the Ethereum virtual machine. And the biggest reason for this is that there's already a ton of lock-in um, to the EVM because it's not just a piece of technology. It's more of an ecosystem. And everyone that builds on top of the EVM, um, they're essentially not only getting that technology, but they're also getting that entire ecosystem of users, existing applications, other developers, um, liquidity. So it becomes really difficult to replace that. Uh, the question is then, like, what is missing from the EVM right now? Well, if you look at Ethereum L1, um, it's not very scalable. And if you look at like the ecosystem of rollups around it as well, like you're not really able to get more than like 30 to 50 transactions per second, um, which is really low by the standards of what applications really need. Um, so if you kind of look at it that way, there's this 
pretty big design space where if you're able to scale the EVM, um, then you're going to really help unlock the kind of things that I talked about with Solana, except on a much larger kind of um, scale. And that's exactly what we're targeting with Save 2 right now. Um, we want to build the first paralyzed EVM. And by doing this, we're going to be able to get the most, uh, best of both Ethereum and Solana um, with support for the EVM while also having this really high performance infrastructure. So there's a couple of things that I think maybe will help for us to clarify for the audience. The first is um, parallelization. How would you describe mm -hmm. that to like a five-year-old, right? What, what exactly is it? People keep hearing about it. They're just like, oh, this is the new thing that's coming. What mm -hmm. is that and, and why is it so important in terms of taking the best from some of these other chains for, say, V2? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So perhaps not maybe an ELI 5 explanation, but maybe like an ELI 10 explanation. Um, the way that computers, or so if you look at the Ethereum virtual machine right now, the way that it works is if you have 100 transactions, let's say each transaction would be like me trying to send you money, you trying to send someone else money. Um, if you have 100 transactions, they'll all get run one after the other. So this is really simple. Like it's really easy for software engineers to um, write software that'll handle this. Um, the issue is that it's not performant. So modern hardware, like the phones that people might be listening to this on, laptops that they're listening to this on, um, they have multiple cores and they're able to support multiple work streams at the same time. So like if someone, um, I guess any kind of application that they're using right now, there's going to be multiple things running on their laptop, for example. Um, so, I mean, if you think about it, like there's already this modern hardware that is capable of doing more. So it's kind of silly that we're not making use of that to enable um, better performance for blockchains. And I think Solano is really the most successful example of this so far, of being able to use multiple cores to be able to get better performance. Um, the Ethereum virtual machine, like if you look at the EVM landscape, no one is doing this right now. And I think there's a couple of issues, like a couple of reasons for that. Um, the first reason is just that it's really complex to build it out. Um, there's also things that like trade-offs that come with that in terms of like increased state. So then you need to think about how to account for this increased state. Um, but we think these are all solvable problems. So we fundamentally think that the EVM needs to become paralyzed. And when you're able to do that, you're able to get a hundred X improvement in throughput. So it does end up, it really does end up being a step function improvement on the EVM. So before we get deeper into kind of what say and say V2 is, um, one of the narratives, which I think are very important uh, across the crypto ecosystem that has been uh, becoming more prevalent, is that uh, all of the altcoins and other chains are R&D for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is going to create L2s, side chains, a variety of different approaches, but you're going to be able to issue some of the coins, uh, do many of the same tasks, et cetera, on top of Bitcoin in some form or fashion. Um, it looks like there is at least developers that are trying to do it. What is mm -hmm. the big difference in your mind as to why things like this can't be built on top of a Bitcoin, regardless of L2, side chain, et cetera, versus having to go build something that's new, whether it is Solana, say, or, or some other uh, approach? Yeah, that is definitely an interesting question. I mean, so I, I think the most fundamental reason is that each piece of technology is created for a very specific type of use case and trying to add a new functionality on top of that. It's essentially trying to fit, like, I forget the phrase over here, um, fitting a square peg into a round hole. Um, you can make it work. It might be functional from an engineering standpoint, um, but it's not going to be the best type of um, product that gets built. It's also not going to be offering the best type of user experience. So, I mean, if you kind of take a step back, uh, we're a Silicon Valley team, like me and my co-founder, we both grew up in the Bay Area. And one of the core ethos of Silicon Valley is to build things that customers want, to solve problems that customers have. And Something that we try to stay away from is over-engineering for the sake of building cool technology, which I think is like really common in crypto, interestingly. Um, there's a lot of projects out there that are building cool tech for the sake of building cool tech. I'm sure you can probably think of probably a half dozen on the top of your head. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it just seems like it's the, the problem that you really want to solve is what are the existing problems with the user experience right now and how do you improve those? And the most clear problem that we're seeing from the UX right now um, is everyone is using the EVM. There's these limitations in the EVM in terms of gas costs and in terms of the design space the developers have. So let's really focus on improving that because that's what's going to cause the biggest tech function change um, for improving um, the EVM. So 
When we then go and we look at what Say is doing, there's a lot of technical trade-offs, right? And we can almost evaluate this maybe as to like, what do you think Ethereum got right, got wrong? What do you think Solana got right, got wrong? And then what are you all doing in terms of these decisions? And, and how are you thinking about trade-offs around security, transaction throughput, et cetera, to come up with what you think is kind of the, the best you know, mix of the ingredients, if you will, to really serve users? Yeah. So in terms of what Ethereum did, right? Um, as I was mentioning before, they like introduced this idea of a Turing complete virtual machine. Um, so, I mean, that's a really complicated way of saying that, like, you're able to build stuff on top of the virtual machine and you can build it however you want to. There's not going to be any limitations in terms of the types of functionality that you're able um, to support. So this really, I, I think, was a major, major kind of new introduction um, because being able to write smart contracts in this decentralized way, um, it really expands the design space of what people are able to do. Um, the thing that I don't think Ethereum got right uh, was they didn't really build it with scaling in mind. Um, from the get-go, like the focus was not to support um, much higher amounts of activity happening on the network. I think they had long-term plans for like, okay, we're going to be supporting execution sharding. Right now they're looking into um, a roll-up centric future. But when they were initially launching, I think that wasn't really a core focus point of theirs. Um, which, I mean, to be fair, I think that is definitely the right way of building. Um, because when they initially launched, there was not really an example of a train complete virtual machine either um, that was used on a blockchain. So I think they were really trying to focus on that initially. Um, what I think Solana did right is they were able to help scale um, a blockchain to be able to support greater throughput. Um, what I don't think that they like, what, what I think they should have done instead of supporting the SVM is trying to use the EVM and then making it backwards compatible. Um, so people can take existing L1 smart contracts from Ethereum, deploy them to Solana with no code changes. And if they had done something like that, I think it would have resulted in a much more seamless developer experience, much more seamless user experience. And it would have resulted in kind of a much um, uh, easier time uh, for people to both build and uh, use Solana. So that, that's why I think that opportunity in the middle of being able to take the EVM and helping scale it in the same way that Solana did um, that is quite significant. So in terms of the trade-offs with an approach like that, um, I think the biggest issue that comes up with parallelization is it leads to increased state. So what is state, right? Um, state is all of the balances um, that are there uh, for both uh, normal accounts. So this would be like, I have 10 say, you have 20 say. Um, and this would also be all smart contract balances. Uh, so all smart contract state. Um, so like this Uniswap smart contract has um, these pools, and this is the kind of uh, information tied to those pools. So there's like this idea of a state tree, which is used to compute the state hash. Um, and you basically need to keep this entire state tree uh, on each of these validator nodes to be able to compute the state hash. And when you have more transactions that are coming in, this leads to more state that gets created, um, which then leads to a couple of different issues. Uh, the first is state storage. Like it just becomes much more difficult to store the state, especially if you want to have lower node requirements. Um, and then the second issue that comes up is it becomes quite difficult to start running a new node. Um, because if you're trying to sync like 100 gigabytes worth of data while there's new blocks that are being processed at the same time, um, it adds an additional complexity. So there's a ton of work we needed to do from the state side um, to be able to better support uh, easier uh, state syncs and better state storage as well. And so what is now going to be possible? Talk to me about applications or use cases that you all see really kind of driving. Right? So I'm a developer. I'm looking mm -hmm. at all of these different uh, opportunities to go build uh, on top of what could I possibly be doing that would make me lean more towards building on, say, versus maybe somewhere else? Today's episode is brought to you by Espresso, the maker of the world's thinnest portable display. Now, listen up. If you're like me, you feel like you are at a command center when you sit down at your desk. I got a gazillion tabs open and different windows for different activities. There's my web browser, my text messages, I have Slack open, and I got a notes app. I normally work on a desktop and it can be very, very productive, but everything falls apart the second I leave my desk. 
If I'm traveling, if I go to a coffee shop to do some work, or just want to work from the kitchen table, my laptop doesn't have enough screen space. I lose my command center, and my productivity falls off a cliff. It's a major problem. But this is where Espresso comes in. They have a portable screen that is so beautiful that you think Steve Jobs came back from the dead to create it. The thing is incredibly light, it comes with a nice stand, and the user interface is so easy that I figured out how to do it in less than three minutes. If you listen to this podcast, you know that's not an easy feat. So the Espresso team and I, we became friends. I got to know them because I really like the product. And those screens, they now want to offer them to any fan of the podcast. So we struck a little deal. Here's how it works. Anyone who listens to this podcast can go to us.espres.so or that's too confusing. Just go click the link in the description. If you go to Espresso's website, they've got a brand new offer there sitting for you. You get a little discount and you'll get a beautiful screen. Trust me, I use mine every day. You'll love the Espresso screen and I think it'll make you more productive. Go check them out today by clicking on the link in the description. Yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, developers out there right now, um, they're basically all EVM developers. And anecdotally speaking, um, like I've been through this process before of like talking to EVM developers and um, just seeing what their thoughts are about moving to new ecosystems. Um, EVM developers do not want to go to new ecosystems. Um, one reason for that is there's like this idea of Ethereum alignment where they don't really want to go to a new ecosystem because of that. Um, but there's also this idea that like new ecosystems have their own quirks. I'm already familiar with the EVM. And if I try to build something in a new ecosystem, let's say I write something in Move, um, and I make even a small bug, then my entire contract can just get drained. My entire project can just die because of this one small bug. So it's a really sc scary kind of um, proposition for them to move somewhere else. So EVMs or developers, they're primarily attached to the EVM right now. Um, and if you think about it that way, like these engineers, they are basically limited by what the EVM is offering them. So if, as I was mentioning before, um, if you look at the landscape of EVM chains, um, Ethereum L1, rollups as well, you can't really get more than 50 TPS. So this leads to anti-patterns that developers need to use to build applications on the EVM. Um, one example of this would be an automated market maker. Um, if you look at traditional financial markets, there's not really a concept of an AMM um, because it's not as capital efficient um, and it has a bunch of other uh, downsides as well. Um, in traditional financial markets, you would see people using order book exchanges, right? Um, the reason that people can't build order book exchanges is because you can't really support that on the EVM. So what say fundamentally unlocks is any type of use case beyond 50 TPS. Um, right now, the entire Ethereum landscape is quite small in terms of what it can support. If you're able to remove that 50 TPS bottleneck and expand it to be 100x higher, um, the design space for developers just changes fundamentally. Um, a few examples that I can think of off the top of my head right now of applications that you could start to see. Um, one of them would be like just fully on-chain order book based exchanges. Um, another example would be a game uh, where you have every single action that is happening um, getting written on-chain instead of only having some kind of token movement um, that ends up occurring on-chain. Um, another example would be some kind of social application where every single activity that the user engages in, like every single like, comment, whatever, retweet, um, all of that and all of their metadata also getting stored on chain. So I think it really results in a lot of different things that you can actually have be verifiable um, on chain instead of needing to have most of it just be stored off chain and then uh, trying to really just store like maybe token transfers or something on chain. Let's talk a little bit about uh, kind of the the organization building uh, on top of the technology, right? You can build great technology, but you still have to do some other things. Um, how are you all thinking about going and educating people in terms of developers and explaining to them how they can use this? Uh, what's been working so far? And are there one or two things maybe that people are building on top of it that you're like, yeah, this is a perfect example. And, and we would love to, you know, just get a hundred more or 200 more of uh, these types of projects on top of the chain. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, say V1 went live on August of 2023. So this was around six months ago. Um, and initially, there wasn't actually that much activity that was happening on the chain. Um, then afterwards, the SAVE 2 proposal got put out in November of 2023, so a couple of months ago. Um, and I think that really stuck a chord um, with the community. And since then, on SAVE 1, there's been a ton of activity uh, that has started to happen. Um, if you look at the stuff that's already happening on SAVE 1, um, I think it falls under largely three buckets. Um, one of these buckets was inscriptions. So initially, there started to be a ton of inscriptions activity on set. Um, and I think this is true for all other ecosystems, but 
in the case of say there was no outage or like downtime that happened um because the chain was just able to handle that kind of throughput that we're seeing um since then i think inscriptions activity has largely died down and now we're starting to see more nft activity um and more kind of token projects that are launching um and more trading activity that's happening so right now on say v1 a lot of the activity is tied to um people that are trading on chain um in terms of say v2 the kind of developer so i mean first of all in terms of like the value proposition um for developers i think it's very straightforward like every single developer that i've talked to has basically just understood it uh the idea of being able to offer greater throughput um with the evm it makes sense to developers for multiple reasons like especially evm developers they've gone through the process of like using eth one and paying gas fees over there so from more of the normal user standpoint it is just fundamentally different and it's a 10x improvement over there um and also from the actual uh, building standpoint, you're able to support, um, as I was mentioning, different types of applications. So developers become excited about that idea as well. Um, in terms of new projects that are going to get built on, say, as a result of this, um, we're seeing two things happening. One is blue chip projects from Ethereum um, are actually just straight up reaching out to us about deploying instances on, say. So this would be like a project on Ethereum that's already launched on Ethereum L1 and is also going to be launching an instance on, say. Um, I think that's definitely exciting because it results in existing Ethereum applications being able to get cheaper gas fees and allowing different types of um, activities for their users. Um, and we're also starting to see more homegrown applications, homegrown in the sense of people that are just dedicated completely to say, um, they're launching their own in-house kind of applications. So maybe we could talk a little bit in terms of the um, financing, like you guys raise some money, token goes live. How do you think about value accrual? right, in terms mm -hmm. of private markets, public markets, um, and the holder base, obviously with the Bitcoin ETF getting approved, people are excited because institutions and kind of bigger funds are coming into the space. Just talk a little bit as to like how you thought about funding the business until now, and then who do you think is actually holding the token, et cetera, in the market? Yeah, yeah. So in terms of, I'm associated with Say Labs. Um, Say Labs is the open source development company. In terms of, I mean, how we raised money, we initially raised money. We had our seed round in that we announced in August of 2022. Um, this was led by Multipoint Capital, and this was, and honestly, right after the Terra collapse happened. Um, so it was definitely not an easy time um, to be raising back then, as I'm uh, sure you can kind of empathize with. Um, but we were super happy to get Multicoin around the table. Um, I think they've been offering a ton of very thoughtful advice in terms of um, just building infrastructure. Um, since then, we uh, raised a Series A um, that was announced in April of 2023. Uh, so some of the biggest checks in that round were um, Jump, Distributed Global, and there are several other partners that were around the table there as well. Um, afterwards, August of 2023 is when Say Foundation uh, helped have the distributed launch um, for the Say Network. And yes, Say Network, so Say is an L1 blockchain. Um, it's a proof of stake blockchain, so there's a token that is associated with that. And similar to like Solana or Ethereum, um, the types of use cases would be largely the same. Um, so one of them would be to help uh, secure the network. So you'd be able to stake it with the network. Um, another example would be for governance. So to be able to vote on any proposals to come in. Um, another use case would be for transaction fees. Um, but I think one thing that's really interesting about a chain like Say, where there's a lot of trading activity that's happening, um, is there ends up being a lot of MEV. Like I was looking at a, a flip side dashboard for MEV recently, like MEV on say, and there's already been millions of dollars of MEV on say, which is kind of wild. Like there's just a ton of, whenever there's a ton of trading volume, it results in a lot of um, opportunities for MEV. And I mean, for any listeners that might not be familiar, MEV is the value you can accrue by changing the ordering of transactions within a block. So either by having one transaction go before another, having a transaction go after another, or potentially including or excluding transactions from a block. Um, so, I mean, there's several different types of MEV, but um, the core idea is that there is some value that gets created. And if you're able to set up a redistribution framework where that value gets redistributed to uh, the chain itself, so for example, to people that are staking on the network, um, then it becomes a very effective way to long time monetize the network um, instead of needing to have inflation for the network. Because um, inflation isn't really the best approach necessarily. Like you want there to be some amount of inflation, but trying to subsidize every single validator, every single node operator on the network through inflation um, isn't necessarily the best approach. But if you have some kind of more sustainable value accrual me mechanism, such as MEV, 
um, then that does result in a much more long-term sustainable network. How do you think about the future in terms of say, you know, you guys have V2, what does this look like in five or 10 years? Is it a winner take all and say is the the king of, you know, kind of smart contracts and, and EVM, et cetera? Um, is it winner take most and maybe there's three or four winners or do we have this like plethora and there's, you know, 5,000 different platforms that people are all building on top of and, and maybe in each one of those scenarios, like where does say fit in? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, in terms of what we have, um, how we think about say, uh, right now we think there's some massive disconnect between Web 2 and Web 3. Like if you go and try to do something in Web 2, it's really simple from a user experience standpoint. And every single part of the process has largely been optimized so far. Um, if you try to do something on Web 3, that is definitely not the case. Like it's a much more cumbersome process. Um, so the world we imagine in a few years, ideally, is one where as a developer, um, if you try to build something on say, it'll offer the same type of developer experience as building it in a Web2 fashion. Um, and from a user standpoint, we, we ideally want the user experience to be identical um, to that of building in Web2. So, I mean, we want to just completely bridge that gap. In terms of how we see the landscape um, kind of moving in the longer term, uh, I do think it's going to be a winner take most markets, uh, winner take most market. And I think there's going to be two different types of um, infrastructure that ends up existing in the future. There's going to be a small number of general purpose chains that end up having a lion's share of the activity. Um, currently, these are chains like Ethereum, L1, and Solana. Um, in the future, uh, if we're able to see a lot of the stuff that I mentioned playing out in terms of more developer activity happening as a result of, say, V2, uh, one of these uh, bigger chains uh, could definitely be safe. Um, so I think it'll be a winner take mark, uh, most market for these general purpose chains. I think there will also be some application specific chains depending on the use case. Um, but I think it's really difficult to make an application specific chain work, um, both from the actual product standpoint and also from the community building standpoint. Um, so I think there's only going to be a handful of those that are successful. And the amount of activity happening there is going to be much lower than the activity happening on these general purpose chains. So another interesting idea is like um, maybe this difference between digital native assets and then kind of real world assets. And this comes up every couple of years. Um, right now, it seems like most of the success has been coalescing around natively digital assets. Yeah. Real world assets. Is that a thing? Can it happen on say? Is that interesting to you all? Is it something that you want to happen on top of say? How do you think about those? Yeah, so it's definitely something that can happen on say. It's something that I think should happen on say. Um, in particular, like say it's going to be a better place for any type of, I mean, honestly, any type of token based activity to happen um, because it's just a much more scalable network. So uh, there's there are projects in the pipeline that are building um, real world assets. Um, the question of whether it's interesting and whether blockchains in general are the place for that activity to happen, um, I think that's something that's still kind of up in the air. Um, especially if yields are low, I there, there's like a lot of like, stuff that doesn't really need to be built on chain, and I think oftentimes people try to force it to happen on chain through uh, real world assets. Um, I think right now that interest rates are high, there's a lot of projects that are trying to offer um, essentially like higher interest rate um, stuff on chain. Um, but as soon as those yields start to go down, I think it's going to be interesting to see um, what happens with a lot of these RWA projects. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of experimentation in the design space, I definitely think folks should experiment there. Um, and I do think, say, is going to end up being one of those places where that experimentation is much easier to facilitate. If you had 30 seconds with a developer and they asked you, you know, why should they build on top of, say, what, what is uh, kind of your pitch to them? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that stands out uh, is you're able to have a much bigger design space as a developer. Um, you're no longer limited by 50 TPS, so you're able to build much more um, elegant applications where you don't need to have any anti-patterns that you make use of to fit the constraints of Ethereum L1. And I mean, this honestly is something that has resonated with a lot of developers. Um, just being able to explore this bigger design space makes their lives easier and allows them to build uh, potentially much more interesting types of applications for users. That, um, that makes sense. And so when you look at um, maybe what you guys are uh, doing today, what is the biggest risk 
or where is the potential biggest like pothole in the road, right? A lot of times we talk about all the positive things, but as the founder of an organization, you think a lot about how do I kill the risk? How do I mitigate that risk to, to ensure success? What are those mm -hmm. things that you're most worried about or uh, trying to mitigate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, for any type of L1, I would say crypto infrastructure more broadly, there ends up being a couple of different things that matter. Um, the first is the technology. Um, the second is the ecosystem, so developers. And the third is the community, so like end users of this technology. Um, from say standpoint right now, I don't think technology is really that big of a risk at this point. Um, like the, there's already a core like Save you one that is live and Save you two. There's been a ton of progress happening towards that. So that's definitely not something that keeps me up at night. Um, the biggest things are just uh, ecosystem and community. I mean, I think community is honestly the thing that's most difficult to um, basically acquire or to create um, because there's so many different types of infrastructure. Um, having your infrastructure be the one that people actually care about, um, it's really tough to set that up. I think in Say's case, we actually had a really wild kind of journey in December, so around a month and a half ago. Uh, where there was the Saiyan meme that took off. Um, and for any listeners that might not have been following on crypto Twitter back then, um, Saiyan is from Dragon Ball Z. Um, it is the kind of alien race that like Goku and all the other main characters um, are. And it sounds really similar to Saiyan. So folks started just memeing about that um, and it really started taking off. And then since then, there's just been a much stronger community that's been emerging on Say. Um, I think one example of activity you start seeing with the stronger community is NFT activity. Um, because NFTs tend to be things that people have much more of an emotional tie to. Um, and you start to see a lot more NFT activity happening in these ecosystems where there is like uh, legit communities that are forming. Um, NFTs also tend to be a lot cheaper to trade um, and they require a lot less sophistication to be able to trade compared to potentially token um, token based projects. So yeah, like or fungible token based projects. but. Yeah, I think that's been super interesting to see come together. And once you start having an organic community, um, then it really incentivizes ecosystems to get formed. So more developers coming in. Um, but yeah, I mean, if say does not end up succeeding in a three year time frame, um, I think it'll be a combination of not enough developers that come on um, and not enough community uh, that's able to get formed. Where can we send people to find you online or find out more about say? Yeah, I mean, to learn more about say, you can go to say's Twitter. So S E I N E T W O R K. Um, and in my case, you can just follow me on Twitter as well. So J-A-Y-E-N-D-R-A -E underscore J-O-G. Awesome. Well, Jay, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, it's obvious that you guys have been pretty thoughtful about what you're building here. And uh, it looks like lots of developers are starting to pay attention. So uh, best of luck in the future. We'll definitely do it again. Cool. Thank you, man.